Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Debbie Fink. I am the Director of Community Outreach and Impact for Respectability. On behalf of Respectability and our generous host, Gutman Community College, and our generous funders, New York Women's Foundation and the Coca-Cola Foundation, and our many collaborating organizations, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first of six trainings in our Women's Disability Leadership Inclusion and Advocacy Series. Today's training, entitled Intersectionality Among Women and Girls with Disabilities and Their Allies, features our fabulous keynote speaker, Dr. Donna Walton, as well as Stephanie Farfan, Respectability's Policy and Practices and Latinx Outreach associate. Um, at this point, I also want to please invite you to silence your cell phones. Uh, thank you so much. Whether you are joining us here in person or virtually via the webinar, we are com confident that you will grow from this experience. Of note, the webinar will conclude after Dr. Walton finishes up her Q&A. For our virtual participants, there is a survey online. Thank you in advance for filling it out, and clearly, please complete questions only relevant to the part of the training covered in the webinar. So to set the stage, I want to define two terms in the title. Allies means individuals who support the cause of a marginalized group or a member in that group, such as women, people with disabilities, people of color, people in the LGBTQ community, Allies learn from that individual or group and amplify their cause. The term intersectionality was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, law, mem uh, excuse me, law professor and social theorist in her 1989 paper, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Race racist politics. Dr. Walton will define and discuss the term much in much more detail soon, so stay tuned. Before Dr. Walton takes, takes over and shares her incredible wisdom, um, Stephanie Farfin will present some relevant statistics and information, and our remarkable executive committee member of the board, Vivian Bass, will introduce Dr. Walton. Thank you, and I now pass the mic to Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Farfan. I am uh, the Latinx uh, Outreach Associate, and I also do policy and practices. I am skipping through some of our bios, which can be found online. Um, for everyone. Okay, so I wanted to start off with some key facts in New York City. Um, these are things that I think we should all know will help set the stage uh, for Dr. Donna Walton's uh, presentation. So did you know that there are almost 500,000 women and girls with disabilities in New York City? Women with a disability on average earn nearly $9,000 less than women without disabilities and a whole $16,000 per year less than men without a disability. About 44% of the city's women with disabilities live below the poverty line. And only 29% of African American women with disabilities are employed, while only 24% of Latinos with disabilities have jobs. Take it borough by borough. So, is there anyone from Brooklyn here? Oh, okay, we have a few from Brooklyn. Okay, so the average income uh, for women with disabilities in Brooklyn is uh, $26,566 a year. That is 28% less than women without a disability, which is a lot. Um, so, is anyone from Queens? Which I'm from Queens. Hi. 
so the average income in Queens is only $24,073 per year, which is 24% uh, less than women without a disability. So is anyone here from Manhattan? Oh, okay. Yay. Uh, so Manhattan, the average income for women with a uh, disability is $23,000. $715, uh, dollars, which is a whopping 54% less than women without a disability, which that inequality is massive. So is anyone from the Bronx? Oh, okay, yay. We have everyone here. Um, the Bronx, the average income is $21,151 per year for women with a disability, which is 28% less uh, than uh, women without a disability. So is anyone from Staten Island? No, it's okay. No, you don't have to be from Staten Island. <laughs> uh, the average income there is also 21,151, uh, and that is 32% less than their um, than women without a disability. Okay, so now let's go into gender-based violence. Um, so the intersection between gender-based violence um, all of these stats are actually on our website, which you can view at respectability.org, uh, and you can peruse. Uh, so we're just going to move on. So now let's talk about adding um, the disability lens towards intersectionality. So by bringing the disability lens, you can help organizations cultivate a more inclusive um, and equitable environment for people with and without disabilities alike. So this is, uh, we're going to talk about what you can do. For one, you can commit publicly to inclusion of people with disabilities uh, to send the message that people are of equal value and must be respected and heard fairly. Uh, this is especially true um, for women of color with disabilities, so our advocacy here is crucial. So your lived experience can make a difference. Integrating and owning um, your multiple identities will make your advocacy much stronger and much more effective. So uh, identity language preference. Uh, it's important to know if you prefer person first or identity first. Uh, a lot of people have different uh, uh, preferences. I personally prefer identity first. Um, so I say disabled person rather than person with a disability. But it really depends on who you are. And so we do have a webinar on disability etiquette that's also on our website. So now uh, we're going to talk about what an inclusionist is. An inclusionist is someone who uh, works with organizations and agencies to uh, advocate for all people with disabilities. It requires you to see beyond your own disability um, and your own accommodation requirements and learn about other disabilities and how they intersect with yours and their accommodation uh, requirements. Again, we do have this resource online as well. And so now let's talk about ensuring digital accessibility. So we need to learn how to identify um, digital inaccessibility um, and figure out who to contact and make a change. And if you don't know or haven't, aren't able to do that, then there are other smaller things you can do as well. Like, you can caption videos if you have a few minutes of your time. You can go on YouTube and start uh, doing like a few minutes of captioning. Um, again, we do have resources online for this. So um, we also can ensure physical accessibility at civic events um, by calling up to ensure that there is uh, accessibility, even if it's something you don't need. Um, and again, we have these resources online. And so this is our disability access checklist. Everyone here in the room has received a copy of this in their packets. It's also available online and on the PowerPoint um, if you requested the PowerPoint before. Hello. Um, sorry for that. Um, so we also uh, do thank you. It's important to have resources ready. Um, so we have a bunch of resources available on our website. We have a list. It's available in English and in Spanish, and it's for everything, for parents, for um, em future employers, for if you're job seeking. You can go on our website and um, find that as well. Okay, so now I'm going to, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, 
Vivian Bass, who will introduce um, uh, Dr. Donna Walton. You are all in for a treat. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Um, Dr. Donna Walton is the author of the powerful book, Shattered Dreams, Broken Pieces, in which she chronicles the decades spent working to rebuild her world through disasters, setbacks, trials, and tribulations. This was due to a dangerous form of bone cancer that threatened Dr. Walton's life and forced the amputation of her left leg above the knee. Respectability is so pleased to give each of you your own copy of Dr. Walton's compelling book. At the end of the training, Dr. Walton will be available to autograph your copy. Overcoming what Walton considers the triple jeopardy to get where she is today, she continues to live by the motto, what's a leg got to do with it? Founder and president of Divas with Disabilities, Dr. Walden has made an unprecedented impact in the disability and women of color communities. As a hub for thoughtful discussion on issues, self-love, and shaping the perception of what disability looks like by promoting women of color through various media platforms. Her work has increased access and inclusion opportunities in countless industries that have traditionally marginalized the participation of the women she represents. In 2017, Dr. Walton joined Respectability's Board of Advisors to help fight stigma and advance opportunities for people with disabilities. Dr. Walton is currently producing a film documentary called Divas with Disabilities that explores the lived experiences of African-American women who live with physical disability in the United States. Dr. Walden earned her bachelor's degree from American University, a master's degree in adult education from Syracuse University, and a doctoral degree in counseling from the George Washington University. Welcome, Donna, and take it away. So, good afternoon, everyone. All right, thank you very much, Vivian, for that welcoming introduction. It's always good to hear yourself read out loud. I am very proud to be here this morning and to serve on this platform to discuss the intersectionality of women and girls with disabilities. Before I begin, though, I need your help, both in this audience and my webinar audience, on the count of three, I need you to say, I am enough. One, two, three. Okay, let's say that again. That's not loud enough. One, two, three. Thank you very much. You know, I'm going to begin this talk with a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who said that our most nettlesome task is to discover how to organize our strengths into compelling power. Now, I start off this quote because Dr. King's quote, I know, was intended to galvanize a movement of people during some very turbulent times, but I think this quote is most befitting for this audience because of the indomitable strength and character and spirit that it takes women of disabilities to live at the intersection of marginalized identities. So it is very important for us to know and believe that we are enough. Now, I haven't always believed that I was enough. The messages have been inundating 
on my journey for over 43 years. That's when I incurred my disability in 1976. I have encountered numerous negative, negative messages that told me that I was not enough. But I'm here to tell you today, I am enough. You are enough. We are enough. So let me give you some examples of my past about the messages, or some, or where some of these messages came from. Let's start with a female rival who told me that I was less than a woman because I have one leg. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into the conversation about what I had with this young woman. That's in my book. Then there is a university uh, administrator who denied me a program because he did not feel that I was smart enough. Now, let's talk about the employer who discriminated against me uh, because, hmm, let's say, uh, I wasn't qualified or perceived that I was overqualified, get that, or hired me and placed me in positions that, I, that were beneath me because of his perception, of course, that I was not competent, right? Um, and I did not have the ability, possibly not. And, and again, the motto, what's a leg got to do with it? Okay, now their boyfriends, don't forget those boyfriends, okay, who could not fathom the one leg thing, right? could not fathom the one leg thing, even when I told some of them that my leg just got tired and walked off one day. They really just could not deal with that. They left. That's okay. But I want to talk about one particular uh, message from a second grade student that I feel was most injurious to my selfhood. And even though he did not know at the time how impactful that message was, when this young boy, and I would say a young white boy, six years old, walks up to my desk, walks up to my desk in my space and say to me, Miss Walton, no man will ever marry you because you have one leg. Now, the reason why that message was so injurious, it's injurious, is because think about the sort of indelible imprint that his attitude has already had, right? That he has taken this message at age six, and he is now internalizing this, right? And where did he get that from? We won't talk about that. And now he's going to carry, he's going to grow up. If there's no one to stop that particular, his, his, his sort of ideas and stigma and, and perceptions and misconceptions about girls, women, who are living with disabilities, whether it's one leg, one arm, it doesn't matter. He takes that into our workplace. He takes that into our organization. And he becomes that person that continually what perpetuates that stigma against women and girls who live with disabilities. Now, I just might say to you that I wasn't always on this path of knowing that I was enough. No, I'm not going to lie to you at all. There were times when I first lost my leg to bone cancer, by the way. Um, my left leg was amputated above the knee. When I came out into the world, I was not ready, and I hid my disability. Now, I live this sort of schizophrenic life with my disability because I wear a prosthetic limb, and it looks good. And I can walk into a room, and you may not know. You might think, ah, sprained ankle, ah, you know, me. But never does one believe that I'm an amputee. So I hid behind that wall for a while because it was easy. 
And I was not proud uh, of my identity as being a disabled woman or young girl. So I just want to let you know that the journey did not always begin with thinking I'm enough. I did not always think I was enough, and I hid behind walls. I hid. I, here's a story. I would show up on blind dates, because, of course, you know, come on, I have to have these blind dates. Oh, yes, I did Internet dating. Okay, yes, I did that, too. And, and the way I would, I would do that is that, you know, because, again, um, on this journey of trying to develop myself, pride and confidence, I would arrive at my dates very early, early. Okay, someone nod and say, here, they, they know what I'm talking about. And what would I do? I would be sitting there just perched in my chair, just perfectly perched, you know, so that he would not see me uh, walk in and have that automatically, you know, I'm not dealing with a woman who's limping or why you're limping, all, all the questions that sort of come with that. So I just want to let you know that it was not always an easy road of disclosing. But now I have found power in self-disclosure. There is power in self-disclosure, right? Because when you show up, you want to show that you occupy the space confidently and boldly, and you deserve to be in that space unapologetically. Yes, I am a black, disabled woman, and I own it. And you own it. We own it. That is the only way that society at large gets it. They have to see us owning it, because if we don't, they certainly will not. So I just wanted to kind of lay that on you for a second. Now, I talked about me hiding my disability. I talked about, I think I've given you a little bit of information about where I started and, you know, what it looks like and how I changed. Now, let me talk about the intersectionality that Debbie uh, referred to earlier. And she's right, absolutely. Kimberly Crenshaw was the, so I'm going to call her the mother, right, of intersectionality. And she says that if we aren't intersectional, some of us, the most vulnerable, are going to fall through the cracks. Okay? Very powerful. She also says that when some people face prejudice, the targeted characteristics overlap. And this makes the manifestations of discrimination. For example, a woman with autism, a woman of color, and an older trans person can face prejudice due to their overlapping social identity. What's more, the way that a woman of color experiences gender discrimination is different from the way that a white woman will experience it. This is what she talks about, okay? Let me tell you about what, I look, what it looks like for me as a black disabled woman with a disability. My identities definitely overlap. And you know what? I never know which one is working against me. I know one of them is, but I don't know which one is, right? Give an example. When I walk into a room for an interview and I'm denied that job, I walk out not knowing if, and I don't know not knowing, I, don't, I never said double major, that's not right. I walk out of that room, and I'm totally confused. Because I don't know if I was not hired because of my color, right? Black woman, okay, got that. I don't know if I wasn't hired because I'm a woman, and I don't believe, you know, I've got the perceptions that I should not have that job um, because I'm a woman, or because I was of my disability. I don't, I don't know. So the overlapping identities are always clashing. They're always in the way. And you have to learn to navigate those. And there is a way to navigate those. And it's really, I know, well, nothing is really simple. And I never want to say that it's simple. By no means. I don't ever want to make it that it's simple. But I do want to say that it's possible. And I say that because I've been on this journey 43 years. Well, actually, okay, I'm just going to out myself. I've been on the journey for 61 years. Okay, fine. I've put it out there. Okay. But that's between us, right? And I have learned, I have learned that the best way to overcome any type of adversity, whether it be discrimination, 
uh, perceptions, misconceptions, if you own it, show that you believe it, and show that you will not back down from it. Yes. I now say I'm a black woman with a disability. And what's the leg got to do with it next? What's the next topic? What we got? Okay, so listen, I was told my time is wrapping up. I cannot believe that because I am on a roll here. But that's okay because I have something else I want to leave you with. Okay, well, Vanda was blinking at me, so I didn't know. Okay, fine. Perfect. So I, okay, yeah. So, I, I, so let's. Okay, excellent. So, okay, Vanda, don't blink at me. Okay. So, so, okay, so, so great. Because what I want to be able to do, what I want to be able to do is to give some strategy, right? Um, and, and don't worry about writing this down. Um, because you'll get a copy of them. They're in my book, by the way. So, so, and I'm not going to tell you a page because I want you to read books. I want you to read the book. Sure. So I want you to um, think about these strategies. Okay, these strategies that I'm about to offer um, give you specific, or give organizations, I should say, um, specific ways to move the needle closer to being more inclusive. Now, the reason why you need to know those those strategies, because then you can have them own it when you don't see it, right? And this is how you identify the organizations that you want to interact with, right? All right, so one, um, and I should say, give, I give a, have to give a shout out to my diva extraordinaire activist, Ola Ojewumi. Okay, so Ola helped to craft these wonderful strategies, and I'm going to share them with you. So, number one, build diverse networks and subgroups. Okay, for example, LGBT disability groups or African American groups. Okay? Two, ensure your organization mirrors your community. Here's a good example. Nothing um, about us without us, right? You don't, you know, we, I remember we were teaching at a university, and I was the only colored person on the, on the staff. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How can this be? You know, I. I this is impossible. I cannot. I cannot represent all of those individuals out there in the community that look like me. One person. It needs to be more of us. Three. Create safe spaces where employees can vent concerns uh, without penaliza um, uh, penalization by hiring an independent diversity manager. Okay. Four. Hold mandatory trainings on unconscious bias ableism, and white privilege. Okay? I see some heads nodding, like, mm-hmm. Um, let's see. Number five. Uh, please don't make a person the spokesperson of their group or race. You know how that feels, right? I can't speak for all black people, y'all. I just can't do it. Don't hold me accountable for that. Okay? Besides, black folks are not monoliths, so I it's impossible. We're all kinds of, we're all kinds of lived experiences. Um, let's see. Number six, uh, seek talent from universities, disability organizations, and nonprofits. Seven, be an ally uh, and use your privilege to your advantage uh, to protect and advocate for people of color and disabled people. Number eight. Please don't ask what one's disability is in the workplace. Why? Because it's illegal for that. Now, that's from the organizational standpoint. Let's move to your role, right? How do you engage in civic life? How do you show up unapologetically, boldly, you know, in your space or in the space that you want to occupy? One. Research, okay, who may, uh, let's see, research representatives, okay, in your area, uh, local, state, national, and cultivate relationships with them, right? Get to know them. Two, um, there are tons of local, or, local organizations uh, seeking members to expand their mission, 
Okay, I recommend um, searching for local community organizations and asking what type of support they need and how your nonprofit can provide it. Okay, number three, mentor, right? Mentor young people and work with the local community organizations. So each one, teach one. You get it, give it to somebody else. We help each other. I'm sitting here looking at the wheelchair queen of New York. Okay, so I, I look at her, and her and her crowd is glowing. Her tiara is glowing at me. So that's just phenomenal um, that she's in this audience today. And let's see, we have some more. Yes. So we have number four, attending local town halls, right? Um, public hearings for local government. Now, one thing to know is disabled, so diversity does not exist without, what have I done wrong? Without disabled. Okay. <laughs> um, lobby for inclusion for people to effectively come out of the closet. Now, I'm not saying out yourself, but you got to know when to show up and say who you are. Because you cannot be served if they don't know you exist. I always say I can't be at the table. I can't make contributions if I don't let them know who I am. If I don't, if, I, if no one knows I'm an amputee, they may not. And I'm encumbered by something in a space. How will they will change that if I don't let them know? You know what? I need to get in here. There needs to be, you know, these things moved out of my way. You know, it needs to be an elevator. If there's not an elevator building, you got to show up and you got to tell the truth. So you got to ask yourself. And we can talk more about that afterwards if someone wants to talk about, you know, how do you navigate coming out, if you will, right? Because sometimes self-disclosure is not always simple. It's not always that simple. Uh, let's see. Four. I don't know. Maybe I skipped some, but here's four. Advocate by informing the audience that you don't get to determine who's disabled. You know, here's a story about that. You can show up in a space. What am I doing? What am I doing? Okay. <laughs> like, this is really awkward here. I'll leave this little microphone. Um, so you can always show up in these spaces. And I said, that. Can you see, Stephanie, you've got me off my point now. Um, number four, thank you. Advocate by informing the audience that you don't have to determine. Okay, yeah. So who makes a decision what looks disabled? What's disabled? Don't you get that? Here's, here's where my organization, the Visa for Disabilities Project, comes in, right? I created this organization to show what disability looks like, right? To amplify the images of black women and women of color, you know, to show that we do exist beyond what you per are perceived that we look like, right? We want to be cast in movies, right? We have a very low percentage. I don't think there are any black women with disabilities in films. If you find one, let me know. But we're working on that one of these initiatives, right, to be involved in Hollywood. I'm going to Hollywood, you know, turn on the television or see a film like, I saw it throughout my notebook. <laughs> because that's important. We have to, they have to see us, right? Um, and we don't have to look like you think, right? Yes, I'm an amputee. I do wear prosthesis. But let me tell you this story. Here's a greater story. Holland, I have a great car. You know, I have a sports car. So what? Right? Drive into a uh, parking space embossed with the you know, disabled symbol, right? And what do people do? Yell penalty, penalties at me because I'm parking in the handicapped space. Mind you, I have my placard, but I get, you know, penalized because what? You know what they say? Come on, you know what they say. You don't look disabled. You do look just, I'm sorry, you don't look disabled. We have to challenge that. There's not a look. What does what what disability look like? So that, that's sort of all of my sort of strategies, right, from both ends. Now, here are two things. This particular poem is in my book. Again, I'm not going to tell you the page, because if I tell you the page, you'll go right to it and you won't read my book. So here's how we define ourselves, or 
who don't or, or don't have others define us. Never try to put me in a box, right? Never try to constrain me or never try to put me in a box of your own making because I am more, so much more, so much more than you can force to fit a tiny space limited by your lack of being. Okay? Mm -hmm, she says. Okay? So, yeah. That, that's, I always feel that way when I wrote that poem. I, I felt that way. Like, don't put me in a box. You know, why do I have to be or be perceived to look like because of your limited vision? Not cool at all. And here's the last thing I want to leave you with before we open for questions. Sandra, am I, am I good on time? See, there we go. There we go. And I, I have it. Okay, here it is. So, so here's something. So check this out. I'm going to try to hope I can cover this. So here it goes. I have one leg. You have two. I limp. You walk. I use a cane, you don't. She speaks with her lips, he speaks with his hands. They use a wheelchair, she's gay, he's straight. I'm black, she's white. They're transgendered, they're Muslim. He is her and her is him. He has Down syndrome, she has autism. She is a little person. We have bipolar depression. He has a learning disability. She has spina bifida. They have traumatic brain injury. She is gifted and talented. She is hearing impaired. He has Tourette's syndrome. Uh, they have visual impairments. She has cerebral palsy. They are deafblind. Privileged, homeless, Irish, rabbi, priest, sheep, Pawnee, Apache, Seneca, Cherokee, Turk, Arab, Swede, German, Eskimo, Scott, Italian, Hungarian, whole Yoruba crew. They are all you. Why? Because this is us too, and we are all enough. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really want to take this time. I forgot to put down the mic. I was going to throw down the mic. I want to take this time. I think the uh, screen went off, but I guess it's all still okay. I don't know if it's over hit that or not. Okay, I did. Um, and open up for questions. I, I hope that I touched on some things that um, you may be able to relate to. What am I doing wrong, Stephanie? Okay. <laughs> all right, excellent. In New York? Are we talking about in America? In, in New York? <laughs> okay.
it is fear. And I, and, I, and, I think your, and I think your comment is well taken. And the comment is about, you know, uh, looking, not looking disabled, having an invisible disability and having a person not really follow the law and really not being able to accommodate the individual um, just based on respect. respect. Um, so, you know, and, I, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to turn this into a lecture on that particular point in particular, and we can talk afterwards. But I do want to share that the reason why a lot of this happens is because out of fear. If you can ignore it and be fearful of it, then you don't have to address it. The, mo the moment you become so aware of it, then you got to deal with it. So it's easy to ignore it, right? I mean, it's sometimes like denial, and maybe that's what it is, you know? We, want, we really want to talk about that. So I'd like to talk more about that with you. Thank you for that comment. Hi. For fear, encounter, for fear of encountering you. So, <laughs> are you? <laughs> so we're talking about normalizing disability, if you will. Yeah, and I, and I like to think of the word as um, being authentic, because you know what's normal, right? So, you know, oh, yes. So it's basically not about the comment that's being made is about normalizing disability. Is that you, you don't have to, again, almost similar to what the other um, participant that talks about, you don't have to just show up looking like what someone thinks you're supposed to look like. And the minute that you do, that you challenge their, their fear. They, you challenge their fear, and they, you, they don't want to see themselves. They can't even imagine, like, oh, wow, that could happen to me. Well, disability is the only type of group that you can join at any time, at any age. It does not discriminate. So welcome. Yes. Congratulations. That comment was very interesting. Do you want to take it? Okay. Okay. So um, there is a, I got um, a question, a uh, comment that was uh, said. Um, it was a very interesting comment. It was uh, one of our guests here has just graduated high school, um, and it's congratulations. Um, the comment was. Uh, do you want to go? Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
That's a very good I can get I can I can definitely relate to the story. The story that the comment that they made is about medical treatment. Uh, because that you, you don't look disabled again, that you, you know, you're denied medical treatment. So, or, you know, you, you don't have access to medical treatment. And I just want to say that it is, it is a real fact that women with disabilities, and black women in particular, are disproportionately affected in the medical system. So, I mean, so the fact that you're not going to get the greatest medical care is, is very real. But here's what here's with my experience is with that. I have, well, on my journey when I first uh, became an amputee, and I would go to the gynecologist, and the gynecologist would never assess whether or not I was having sex or not. They never asked me if I was sexually active. Okay? Now, I was very telling, very early, right? I mean, what was the sign? And since I, you know, women with disability were not sexualized, you know, we're not, we're not deemed as, you know, women who somewhat worthy of love, right? It's just all kinds of messages. So, I mean, I have not been denied, if you will, the innocent. Yes, because if you're not being asked if you're sexually active, then I am being denied a particular service that may help me to comfort or at least. Who to make that judgment, right? So, I, I, did, I have had that uh, similar experience. And it is frustrating. And that's why the advocacy is so important, you know, showing up. And sometimes I know it comes off as if we uh, have too many questions to ask, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the way to ask it. Right. Well, how are uh, you asking? Because you're not supposed to. So we can, uh, we can talk more about other stories.
show an example. If each one teach one, I mean, as advocates, as allies, I think that I was talking to, to my to my uh, friend, my family member, Vanda, uh, and she, we talked to her, she said, well, what can I do, you know, as an ally, besides being your, your friend and, and supporting you? I said, you know, it's a great question. So, you know, if you go into a restaurant and you see that, you know, it's not accessible, you can speak up on, when, and if I'm not there. We can show up. We can, we can help each other. You see something, say something. You know, you know I don't, the person with a disability doesn't have to be with me in order for you to support us. Well, welcome. Well, thank you very much for showing up. And I just want to make one comment, I think, that speaks to both of your, your statements. And that is, you know, and it's, just, it's, it's dawned on me what you said about the environment being comfortable for people without disabilities. You know? And I think about, you know, if we would just, if there would just be universal design, right? If, if everything was, was equal. Just design spaces, right, that everyone could have, you know, access. Equal or, e or easy access, if you will, then we wouldn't have all this discussion, right? Or uh, equal. I mean, I, I think about the, you know the, the, the handicap star, that star, right? We know how it works. Exactly. I think. Well, that, that, that's a, that's a whole yeah. How many of them correct? That's an issue. But you know, the number of them, right? The number of them and the number of people who abuse them. You know, I hold my friends accountable all the time. They know if I come into the oh my God, here she comes, can't use the bathroom. 
And, you know, and they ask if they, they will can I use it if no one's in there. I say, you know what? Actually, no. No. Because you don't know if someone will come in there. And then you might fit when they're in the store. But anyway, thank you for your comment. So we have, we have one more minute. Okay, and so you're, you're the lucky person because we have one minute and one question. Well, welcome very much, and thank you very much for showing up. Even though you were late, I'm going to forgive you for that because you missed my talk. So I'm not going to, but I, you, you did. But it is. Yeah, it is. But I, I want to say with the, the participants just basically said they wanted to uh, thank Respectability for having this forum to discuss this particular topic of women and girls and intersectionality and um, sh sharing your lived experience of how you are now coming to terms with standing in your power, right, and authentically owning your disability and seeing that there you have allies around you. And I do want to put a plug in for Divas with Disabilities Project. You need to come on over and join us, okay? So, um, but anyway, I want to, I guess, end my, speech, my talk with you today and to let you know that I appreciate your attention and I hope 
that I can be of value to you as we move throughout this day. Um, so feel free to come and talk with me later on, and I'll be here to sign your books if you would like us to do so. Thank you. 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 Thank you.